Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is the last in the current series of NGCDI Thought Leadership Talks. Uh, so I am Arjun Parikh. I am a senior manager within BT Applied Research, um, and my area of interest is self-learning networks. Um, uh, the previous talks that um, <clears throat> we've had in this series, if you didn't catch those, they are uh, available on the website. So that is ng-cdi.org. And so the recordings of all the um, previous talks can be found there. We are also planning a second round for later in this year, so keep an eye out there and we will um, also kind of send information out on all the other channels that, that you would have seen the invite for this on. Um, so today's talk is on world models and digital networks, and mm -hmm. I am very pleased to introduce Professor Robert uh, Piocchi. Rob is a professor at the University of Bristol uh, in the School of Computer Science, uh, Electrical and Electronic Engineering and Engineering Maths. Um, and his interests span areas of connected intelligence systems, um, particularly connected autonomous vehicles uh, and wireless sensing for e-health. Uh, Rob. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's absolute thrill and pleasure uh, to be uh, with you today. Uh, right, so without further ado, I'd like to dive in straight away. We've got a lot to cover. So here's the, the plan. So there's actually two elements um, uh, to the talk. The first one is kind of overarching uh, view, and that can be simplified into two stages. So um, what I'm going to talk about is intelligent systems of various kinds, and specifically in the context of um, digital networks. And I'm going to um, argue that strategy where in stage one, we learn the world. And when I, and when I say learn the world, I mean specifically the model. So there is the world, and I'm going to um, develop um, various elements uh, of this model, uh, and I'm going to use those kind of little cogs um, to signify that there's in fact machinery uh, in there. Uh, and I'm going to one by one add to this machinery. So those, will, you know, the, those little cogs will appear sequentially. And only after that, after um, uh, we learned uh, our world model, uh, a, we will start solving particular tasks. Now, I should say that this two-stage approach is not something that I have uh, thought about or created. This is well-recognized strategy that has been, in the last few years, evangelized by a number of people in uh, AI, machine learning. I, I put here three very prominent names uh, in here, scientists uh, who, under the guises of, of, of supervised learning, so all of them, they gave talks and wrote lots of papers um, uh, in the context of unsupervised learning. And they, they argue that this way forward is in fact the holy grail of intelligence. And also I wanna make a connection that in, in fact, uh, that's exactly how advanced biological life is, is solving the problem. So the problem that I specifically will be talking about is the problem of sequential optimal decision-making and advanced biological life, such as humans, um, approach that problem roughly along these lines. You know, so we, when we are young, we we sort of uh, play uh, with the world, we observe it, we try to develop um, common sense, common sense reasoning um, about the world before we grow up and 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 do these tasks. Um, this is not perfect analogy because the stage one never really finishes. But specifically, I want to contrast it uh, with uh, what, what I'm going to be calling uh, Life 1.0. And I should say, I borrowed those labels from a fantastic book by Max Tegmark, who wrote a book titled Life 3.0. So uh, what are the differences? Uh, so Life 1.0 um, essentially means a bacterial life. And using a, a geeky terminology in life 5.0, what we observe is that um, the behavior policy does not really change. Um, so um, the way bacteria works, uh, behaves in the world is hard coded. Um, so it has a hard coded world model and no firmware updates uh, happen during the lifetime of, of, uh, of bacteria. Um, the updates only happen in between generations, okay? And what I want to argue is that this, this, this is a drastically a different um, uh, solution to the life problem. 
where in fact updates and, and learning process happens uh, within um, the lifetime. And you probably can see where I'm going with this. I want to say that our, our current approach um, to, um, to optimizing digital systems is more akin to uh, life uh, uh, 1.0. And, and I just want to make uh, clear, this is not derogatory. Um, I don't mean it in, in that way. Uh, because bacteria is actually fantastic at what it's doing. So it's perfectly and optimally fit for its purposes. It, it, it's in, 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 it does it in an extremely uh, good way. So uh, how are we going to go about this? Uh, here are the stages uh, of the talk. I'm going to start with uh, requirements, motivations, examples. I'm going to start with a few simple examples um, to motivate what we do. Uh, then I will introduce progressively this machinery that, that we need. And it's going to be representations, dynamics. Uh, I'm going to unpack those terms. Uh, in the third part, I'm going to show you a few examples, recent examples from uh, uh, different domains, how this approach has been successful. And uh, towards the end, I'm just uh, um, I'll, pro I'll provide a few arguments why uh, we could try to do the same in the context of uh, wireless systems and open ground and, and so on. And I hope to have a discussion. Uh, this is very much. Um, Sort of open-ended, uh, open-ended ideas that that are hopefully will will fertilize really good discussion at the end. Okay, my first, um, hopefully very cute example that that motivates um, um, the, the requirements. So, storks deliver babies. Um, all children know it that this is absolutely true. And in fact, uh, if if we look at at the data, so this is data. Uh, comes from this particular uh, paper, and what we have here is uh, this is this, this, these are data points uh, for a number of European countries, and specifically we have uh, storks here in this column number three, and the birth rate, so number of babies born, uh, sorry, thousands of babies born per year. And what we see is that whenever there's lots of storks, we have lots of babies. Okay, lots of storks, lots of babies, few storks, few babies. Okay. Um, so, in fact, if we plug those two data points uh, in, in, into our hypothesis that stroke deliver babies, uh, we conclude that, in fact, this is true uh, with a p-value of 0 0.008. And you may know that anything below sort of uh, 0.5 is considered as, as a decent hypothesis. Uh, example number two. So what we have here is, is uh, um, an example from transportation. I labeled it autonomous cars, but it can be anything. So what we have here is a traffic flow, and I'm interested in studying um, uh, vehicles or speeds of vehicles that follow immediately one after another. Okay, and I, and I plot here um, those, those data points. So what I have here is a, is a speed of vehicle we are interested in, and here is the speed of the vehicle that's immediately in front of us. Okay, and you can see there is there, there is a um, as expected um, very high correlation. Uh, in fact, um, you know we can easily derive a very plausible uh, policy data derived uh, uh, policy based on what we can see here is that um, you know if we want to stop the vehicle that is in the front of us, all we have to do is uh, smash on on our brakes. Okay, that's in fact what would have happened if you gave that data to any. Um, data derived um, or machine learning um, algorithm. So what's going on in these models? I'm sure all of you uh, know exactly what's going on. And this is colloquially known as, as correlation does not imply causation uh, fallacy. Okay. Um, so in the first um, case, what we have is uh, what is known as a confounder or confounding variable. Um, so initially when I uh, when I just look at um, the stock populations and babies, um, what, what I can see immediately that in, in fact there is a correlation. Okay, so the joint distribution does not factor. But as soon as I introduce a, a, another piece of, of evidence, another piece of data, in this case this is the land, then what we see is that in fact, uh, well, what, what we expect um, is that large countries have large populations okay so the land if land is big we expect to have lots of storks and big land hosts uh, big populations big populations produce lots of babies so um, if we condition on that piece of knowledge um, so now we look at this conditional distribution 
this becomes independent, okay? And then we denote this uh, that way, that X and Y's babies and storks are in fact independent if we condition on the land. And the second um, uh, situation is, 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 is reverse causality. Okay, so we study those two vehicles and, and yeah, there's obviously correlation between the speed, but in fact, it's the, the reverse correlation. <clears throat> it is the Y uh, that impacts uh, the speed of X, not the other way around. And to, to ascertain this, what we really need to do is if we just, if you have only those two pieces of information, we really need to act in, in the world, okay? There's no other way of untangling this. So, and this is denoted in, in people who study causal relationship by, by this kind of uh, weird looking stuff. But what that means is, you really need to slam on the brake on X and then figure out that in fact, this will not, in most cases, will not stop the vehicle in front of you. Um, so co to conclude, uh, we need to have relevant data. Yeah, if we model this kind of situations, we need to have relevant data. And ideally, we need to be able to act in the world uh, in addition to having relevant data. Okay, so this is the second uh, uh, um, argument that I need. And I, I must say, I didn't need to use um, this video, but that's my homage to what SpaceX is doing. Okay, see, so uh, those who are um, space geeks, you might know that SpaceX is developing Starship. And uh, this is an attempt of landing, propulsively landing a reusable vehicle. This is Starship 8, happened December last year, and you can see what happened. Okay, um, uh, many people think this is a failure, but I think this is a great success. But really what, what I want to convey here is, um, is that we cannot really act in real world. Okay, again, it's, it's fairly obvious um, that they, they, you know, there's, there are many, many cases where you cannot act in real world. Um, and, and the second um, idea I want to convey is, if, if we were to use very popular these days, re vanilla reinforcement learning techniques, uh, we, we know we, we, we train those uh, uh, techniques uh, by, by running a number of episodes. Uh, each episode means one attempt at landing. So, you, you know, this would be, you would need tens of millions of episodes. Uh, certainly you cannot afford to crash tens of millions of, of starships. But even more importantly, even if you were doing that in some sort of model um, and use vanilla technique, vanilla reinforcement learning, such as DQN, uh, SAC or PPO, or whatever is your favorite um, RL controller, then that still may not be a great idea because um, if something was to change, for example, you change the flaps, uh, the size of, of this vehicle, you have to re redo the process from scratch because, um, you know, those algorithms did not really reason uh, in any way. They literally, they, 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 they perform brute force of map be, be between what they really see into actions. Okay, so here I'm, I'm, I'm going to award myself uh, the first of these cogs. And this, this tells us that these are the requirements, requirements that we need. So we will need a model of real life and we need to be able to act in that model. Okay, so here is uh, now um, an exercise. And in fact, this is exercise for you. So this is the interactive part of, of, of this lecture. So I'm gonna read out the instructions for you. And the instructions are, soon our world will regain sanity and you will be back in your office. Now close your eyes and plan the sequence of actions so that you can go to the kitchen and get yourself a mug of coffee. Okay, and you can pick up, or you can think about the additional task and that's to pick up a mail, maybe print out printouts on your way. And I genuinely mean it. Can you please now close your eyes? Okay, I'm gonna close my eyes myself. Teleport uh, myself in space and time. So hopefully it's just a small, Hop, small leap, just a few weeks ahead of time. I'm going to be in my office. And now I feel an urge. I feel a urge of a coffee, um, a caffeine fix, and I need to satisfy it. Okay, how, how do I plan my actions? What are the actions? Okay, so please, I'm going to now uh, be silent for about five seconds. Please do that. Plan, plan your actions. Okay, so I can tell you how I've done this. So um, my office is in Bristol, University of Bristol. I'm on the fourth floor 
Okay, so to get a coffee, I need to leave my office. I'm I, first. I'm going to turn left. Um, then I, I will go um, to pick up a, a, a printer. Printer is on the left hand side, not long distance from my office. Then I know that if I want to get mail, I need to walk uh, two um, stories down. So I'm going to take several flights of stairs. I'm going to pick my mail. Then I need to go up because the coffee room is on the third floor. And bingo, I'm, I'm going to make, make myself a coffee and indulge myself. Um, so what I'm trying to get across is that in this plan, um, there was almost certainly um, no detail uh, in, in, in terms of um, visual scenery. Um, there, was, there were no sounds, no flickering lights, no wall posters, nothing redundant. There, there was just, um, you know, the, the, the basic um, idea in the and basic information that you needed to plan this. What you have done, in fact, you have done planning in the latent representation space. So this is the, the kind of a geeky term that I, I want to use. This is this unobserved latent representation space. And by the way, um, this is a kind of side comment. Uh, that's what our brains are doing all the time anyway. Um, even with your eyes open, what you really see is not really um, the objective uh, reality. It's, it's the kind of lovely quote from Anil Seth, your brain hallucinates your conscious reality. It's just to say our brains in fact operate um, uh, where, where we build our model of what we really need in our brains in a kind of Bayesian setup and then just use um, the observed data to refine that model in our head. Uh, because in fact, our brains never evolved to solve very complicated tasks, our, our, our specifically to understand the nature of, of objective reality. Our brains only evolve for one only purpose and that's to, to keep us alive. And that's what we need to keep us alive. Okay, so latent representation space, I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit geeky now and define what that really means. Um, so um, here I've got an example of several modalities. So the different uh, type of modalities. First is an image. Here is a sound, some text, and maybe a network state. Okay, so we have a network, digital network. We are interested in digital networks uh, in this project. And when I say representation or latent representation space, I mean a function a map that will take us this, this um, um, object in here on the left-hand side and produce a bunch of numbers. That's what I really need. Uh, and we need a bunch of numbers because ultimately we're working with machines and that's what machines understand. So let, let me just quickly uh, uh, summarize um, those our observations here. So representation really is a map from raw input. Okay, so this, this is um, uh, the data that is specific for modality might be pixels or sound waves into what we're going to call a feature, a vector, basically a bunch of num numbers in whatever form this might be, maybe a vector matrix or a tensor. But we want that uh, map um, to offer some specific uh, features. Um, so uh, what, what we want is um, for that, that map to offer sufficient abstraction and invariance. And what I mean by that is, we want to abstract away everything that is not really important uh, here. Okay, so just preserve the salient information, remove all redundancy. And we also want that thing to be inconsequential to changes, um, some changes that, that, that are not important for the task. So for images that might be scale, rotation, translation. In, in other words, you know, if I'm looking at the dog, then if I'm standing um, maybe two or three meters further away from the dog, the dog may, may subjectively appear to be smaller because I'm further away, but it's still the same dog. So it, the representation should be the same. So that's the, that's the scale. The same for rotation and translation and other changes that are inconsequential. And another important aspect that I would really want, this is my wish list, is a disentanglement. So in that representation here, there will be um, various uh, aspects of it. Uh, which might, might be um, some features, uh, some elements of, 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 of this dog or, or, or waveform or whatever else. And what I want is to be uh, able to see changes in that 
as a kind of independent independent factors in here. Okay, so that that's very useful uh, aspect of those representations. If I could have that. Okay, so from a sort of hand wavy description, I, I want to offer a little bit of a of a more uh, mathematical view. Okay, it's it's hopefully you're gonna bear with me. So, what's really happening with those latent representation? What that really means? So let, let me just be very clear why this is not an easy uh, thing to, to, to do. So if I look at an image, okay, I'm interested in some semantic content of that that image. Okay, so that's that's you know when you close your eyes, you can think about the dog. That that's what it is. It's the semantic content. But what I really get is the data, data X. Okay, so I want to make it absolutely clear: data X is not the same than semantic content. So X in this case would be a pixels. Okay, so there's lots of pixels in here. And what, what I want to do is, is, is from these pixels to be able to get some this, this um, approximation to the semantic content. So we have some machinery in, in, in information theory that tells us a little bit what needs to happen. Okay, and, and then the particular a uh, tool that I need is called uh, mutual information, and it essentially this is the definition. But the kind of intuition behind what that is is we, we used actually a lot in in studying communication systems uh, because the max of mutual information is the capacity. We we you know we study capacities a lot. But um, what, what that means is you now if you have a two random variables x and y, and I observe only one of them, for example, I observed x, um, then I uh, this allows me to learn something about why, and the amount of information I'm gleaning about of why is, is exactly measured uh, by this mutual information, and this is a number of bits of information I'm gaining, and that's in fact that that interpretation. So this is a reduction in uncertainty. But uh, another piece that I need is something called data processing inequality. So that's an important uh, uh, property. So if I have any Markov chain of that order, so X gives rise to Y, Y gives rise uh, to Z, it can be any number. But what is important is that if we study this, this mutual information between those pairs, so between the first and second, and then first and, and, and third, what we see that the mutual information um, becomes smaller or certainly no, no greater. It can only drop. But more importantly, what that means is information cannot be created in that chain. Okay, there, there's no signal processing or machine learning tricks that can add to information. That, that's 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 the main um, lesson from here. And now we, we, when I apply this and think about those representation layers, uh, that tells us what really is happening in those deep neural nets. Okay, that's in fact paper that, that makes this argument here. So what's really happening is um, as we process this information between those layers, what really happens is we know information cannot be created. Okay, we cannot um, um, plug it out of thin air. So the information at best remains the same. But yet we kind of we are able to squash this thing down the line and produce representations that in fact provide um, a lot of, of this original information about the semantic content. And and we're still doing very well. Okay, so essentially this this provides interpretation to what these deep neural nets are doing is essentially they are progressively removing redundant information as we well not, let's not call it information some redundant stuff as we go forward. And we can we, we can um, formalize uh, this goal um, using again some stuff. Again, no time to to go into this. What I want to say is. There are clear connections with ray distortion theory in here. Okay, um, I, I want to move uh, slightly the gear and develop um, um, one more cog. So a little bit. This is the I think the final piece of a little bit of um, mathematical machinery that, that we need. Hopefully it's going to be very simple. We're going to model now world dynamics. Okay, in our world model we want to know how the world model evolves over time. And let me start uh, with an example when we have um, uh, four consecutive uh, states of, of the world. Okay, so we have um, at some uh, st, it can be any number. Uh, using chain rule for probability, we can always, always factorize it that way. Okay, so this is um, probability of, of this guy uh, given all the past, and then uh, the earlier guy, all, all its past, and so on. 
if we are in the lark, we can assume Markov property, which just means if I condition my state of the world at the one that is just um, uh, immediately prior, everything uh, before what happened is independent. Okay, so what happened just before fully describes uh, in probabilistic sense uh, what's happening right now. I also mentioned we want to be able to act in the world, so I need to have some kind of behavior policy. So I'm, I'm going to plug in, in here uh, as well. But the main thing I want to say is, is this, and that's what we're going to call the dynamics. So this is this probabilistic function uh, that tells us how the world evolves, how it all changes. And, and, and the question is, can we model this thing? Okay, because I'll, at the end of the day, we need that. We need to be able to model um, this, 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 this evolution of the state of the world. Okay, so I've got this uh, function. And um, um, when you see that kind of function, you should really think of this. Okay, so literally, so whatever this is uh, stochastic or deterministic, what it does, it, it takes as an input state of the world at, uh, at time t and action at time t, and will tell you what will happen in, in, going into the future. And literally, that, that's what I mean. Okay, so there is some function that takes uh, as input state of the world action at time t and will tell you what's going to happen uh, afterwards. The only mild assumption I'm going to make here is that this function is piecewise continuous. Okay, other than that, it can be anything. And another thing is I'm, I'm plotting here 1d, 1d to 1d. This is, looks a bit strange because I've got already here two variables, uh, but for, um, rep, uh, for graphics, for presentation purposes, I cannot do it. Uh, more. But this works in any dimension, that's what I'm going to say, as long as it's piecewise continuous. And um, uh, what I'm going to use is uh, the fact that um, this doesn't get really taught in, in kind of machine learning courses until, until very advanced topics, but it's actually quite fundamental and in fact it's simple, is that neural networks are in fact uh, function approximators. Uh, uh, they, every single thing you do with a neural network, you always approximate function really under, under the bonnet. And we can use that uh, that fact to really to model our dynamics as well. Okay, so you have a neural net that takes a state of the world and produces um, uh, or predicts a, a state of the world into the future. And just one quick slide on on how this is done. Okay, uh, okay, so this is again graphical, quick tutorial on on on. Um, the kind of hand, hand wavy version of what is known as a universal function approximation theorem. So I've got a shallow network, okay, state of the world, time t, state of the world, um, into the future. Shallow network, one just hidden layer. Inside I've got activation function, which is looks like a little bit like S. It can be any function of that shape or most of them, um, but has to be nonlinear. It has two parameters, uh, W and, and B. Uh, this is, by the way, called sigmoid function. And so the reason why this is, uh, that kind of function is because I can do the following trick. What I can do now is if I take two of those S's, put them together. So I've got this uh, red S and, and, uh, and the yellow S, and I, I can tune the slope of this by tuning W and, and, and the shift of this by tuning B. I can create those bumps, and you can see where I'm going with this. Whatever is that function of the world I want to approximate, I can stick sufficient number of those bumps underneath to approximate that function. Okay, that's exactly what's going to happen. So I've got this, you know, those bumps. Uh, it can be upwards, downwards, by tuning these parameters. If you take sufficient number of them, in this case, I think this was 10 of them, you can see I get pretty good approximation. And that's really at the bottom what neural nets are doing. Uh, approximating any function you, 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 you may want. You take sufficient number of bumps, you, you can approximate uh, everything. And the expressiveness actually uh, becomes even greater with the um, when you have more layers, so really you can do a lot, and that's in fact explains the success. Um, so that's what you do. How do we do in practice? We need to train. Training simply means um, having enough of data sets, which you can think of it on that graph would be points from those functions you want to approximate, and and then you use backprop um, to find iteratively uh, those w's and b's. So you, you refine uh, your approximations uh, as you go along. All great. A um, few issues. Um, just to be fair, what I've um, what I've just described is a deterministic function, okay? And, and the world may be stochastic. Um, so that's that's yes. In other words, whatever is my state of the world, an action, um, what I, what's going to happen into the future? It's not one specific thing. There's a distribution of things that can happen. OK, 
okay, so I need to be able to, to, um, to model stochastic functions. We can do that. And the second, perhaps even more tricky, is that what we talked about earlier is this uh, latent representation. We want to model dynamics in this latent imaginary world as well. And that's uh, tricky. Okay, so before everybody jumps and says we use models already, um, just preemptive slide, yes, we do uh, uh, models already. Um, there's, a, there's a pack of models, hidden macro models, factor graphs, everything you name it, even um, things that are called digital twins, and they are uh, related. If time permits, we can, we can uh, go back to this. But what I want to say is all these models are what I, what I call expert models. So they are all handcrafted by experts. What we are advocating here is the learnable models, okay? Models that will be able to refine, do a better and better job as new data arrives. And we use digital twins in the project as well. Um, there are good reasons. And again, as I said, there's a pile of, of really good work coming from the community over the last decades, and we should do, absolutely use it. And it's also used in, in, in industry. Um, so again, one slide. How Waymo? Waymo is the division spun out from Google that's doing automated cars, and they use a lot of um, kind of models. We actually don't know what they do, whether this is handcrafted model or with a learnable model. They they don't say it as, as you would expect. They won't tell you, but but could be they, they, there's a mixture of those things, and and you know and they use it extensively. Okay, um, so um, that that's what uh, needs to be said. Okay, so let me now go to um, the next stage of, of, of the talk where I'm going to show you some success stories, recent success stories from those uh, disciplines. And um, in this first example is the vision, example from vision domain. And there are two things I, I want to emphasize here. One is that this stuff is really amazing. Uh, when we approach the system in two stages, this works better. Uh, or it's at least more efficient, data efficient strategy than the image classific classifier that have been proposed before. And the second thing I want to say is there's another trick in here, and this is what I've mentioned um, just a few slides earlier, that learning representations, those, le those, those latent representations is actually tricky because we have no access to ground truth. Yeah, we don't have access to this, um, the meaning of, of it, the semantic content. Um, and we need some tricks, and this is one of the tricks we can do. So what we have here is that the here this is all um, all those functions arrows are just neural nets, and the kind of data pipelines, and the, the intuition behind this we are forcing this this uh, kind of dual uh, system uh, to recognize that in fact it, it's the same dog we were talking about. So here we have an image of the dog, and and the point is we're going to push through one chain, one random transformation of that image. Okay, so this might be uh, the original image, and we maybe take a crop, uh, or maybe slightly change color, uh, or maybe a rotation. Okay, and to us, to you know, to human eye, we know it's the same dog. Uh, we're gonna push it that way, and push some under random representation. Um, so I should not use representation. Some under transformation of this original uh, dog through that way, and we ask the the system literally force it to recognize that in fact this is the same. Okay, and this is very helpful in learning those representations. This allows us also much more efficient use of the data because we can do lots of lots of these tricks. So you can crank up value from your, each data point. Uh, but most importantly, at least for images here, the value is that we don't need labels. Okay, so that's why it's called self-supervised. This is imaging, amazing breakthrough. Okay, normally those, those old uh, machine learning systems, in training you have to provide label. Okay, so you have an image, and people will literally will look at millions of images and manually would add labels. You don't need to do that anymore. Okay, you, you, you can do this kind of trick. You don't need labels. You can take any image. This is done by machine itself, uh, this rotation, and you learn this representation. And only after you learn this um, world, you do the classification task. And for that, you need just a small number of, of labeled examples, very small fraction of the total data set. And, and the message is this works uh, super amazingly. Okay, I should say this is the same um, or more or less similar trick is happening with uh, natural language models. Okay, so uh, BERT, uh, it's revolutionized um, uh, language models. 
And again, so what is a language model? A language model is essentially a, a model, kind of predictive model, that if I tell you a sentence, it will tell you, or some, some uh, um, sequence of words, it will tell you what should come after. Okay. And the way we train these things is again in a self supervised manner. So essentially, this is the instruction, and I'll, I'll uh, an example how we do that. We basically we feed um, text. In practice, we feed absolute tones of text, everything you can get hold of, wrap. Uh, so, literally, whole Wikipedia, everything you can find. And you're going to learn, train this by masking parts um, of, of the text. Okay, so for example, you put that, this is the entire sentence. Then you ask machine, select several words in here. So basically pretend you don't know any more this. That's what you're telling machine. And uh, from the other words, uh, guess what this missing um, uh, word should be. But because in fact, you know that word, you can derive a, a, um, a lost signal uh, later. And you do it several times, masking randomly different things, feed the entire Wikipedia. Uh, you add, add an additional few other trickery. There's a lot of trickery. Um, for example, guessing the given two sentences, um, um, guessing which in which order those two, two sentences sh should come. This helps to reinforce the kind of long term structure in the language. So you, you, and you train this, this humongously complicated machine uh, in a completely self supervised way. OK, no, no labels. And once you do that, you can then with a little bit of extra example in stage two, do this addition, this NLP task like machine translation from one language to another. Q and A, uh, summarize the text, and so on. Again, super successful strategy uses explicitly those two stages. Stage one, run, learn your model. Stage two, to uh, perform the tasks. Alpha fault. Uh, okay, I've got about ten minutes and good number of slides. I'm going to be super super quick here. Um, alpha fault implicitly using uh, um, the same strategy as well. So alpha fold, uh, the task here is to, uh, to predict 3D shapes of proteins. Okay, so proteins are those essential molecules of life. Those are those workers that perform actions. Um, and, and the point is, uh, if you know the, the chemical structure, that, that's, that doesn't tell you anything uh, about this. You need to really know the shape because it's the shape that, that uh, determines what this protein will do and how it will act. Proteins are composed of um, amino acids. There are 20 of them. Each of them looks like, like this. This is the simplest uh, glycine. And they have the one bit is the same, and they have this tail um, that is slightly different, different chemical um, structure of the tail. And this is the interaction between the tails. So if you put those guys in here, uh, the interaction between those tails will shape this thing. Um, so the, the task here is given a sequence of, of amino acids. Can we predict what? The shape will be, and and and, how, and hence um, um, know how it will act. Very important um, um, task, and and the way this works or this has been solved recently is again two stage. Stage one, we use a dat database of all possible uh, proteins that we already have, study how they behave. So in in other words, build a little world of um, uh, micro uh, uh, biology of molecular biology, essentially understand that world and only stage to predict. OK, and I, I want to show one more example. And and uh, this is uh, important doubly, um, and this is uh, alpha go uh, zero. So alpha go. Um, I'm sure it didn't go amiss to you that that has been a great success in AI. It's the algorithm um, that I think was about four years ago beat uh, Lee Sedol in Game of Go. Game of Go is this uh, Chinese ancient game that's been considered the gold standard for AI. It was much, much harder to solve than, than chess. And, and Alpha uh, Go Zero is the next generation. So in fact, there's been already four generations. So since that happened, AlphaGo, there, there are four generations. And, and I'm going to touch on two of them. The AlphaGo Zero is, is the next one. Then um, it was uh, Alpha Zero was the third one. And Mu Zero is the latest generation, which is in fact the most impressive of all of them, uh, but didn't make much of, uh, of uh, public um, uh, press. Um, 
so we don't have the time too much to go into details of this, but this is absolutely marvel of an algorithm, AlphaGo Zero. Uh, what it does, it, it combines two strategies, and, and the best analogy I can think of, actually it's not, um, I, okay, credit where it's due. David Barber from UCL um, developed algorithm at the same time, and he used an analogy of thinking fast and slow. And this is from Danny Kahneman's book, System One, System Two. Um, so there are two things happening. Um, and we have a system one, which is this intuitive system. Uh, and this is a meticulous uh, planning, long-term planning system. What is amazing, you can combine those two and you can develop policies by kind of iterating between uh, those two. So what I want to say is playing computer games is in, at, at, at essence um, uh, optimization on a tree. Okay, so each move on, on this board um, implies a number of decisions, a lot of decisions. And then if you plan in the future, you grow this tree. So at, at each level, this tree grows exponentially. So you cannot solve this problem because of the complexity of this. It becomes stupendously difficult. So what you need to do is start pruning. And that, that's where how this algorithm really works. You don't explore every single possibility. It's, you know, it cannot be done. But you use intuition, really. What makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And that's why you have this humongous neural net underneath that will evaluate the, the position, the, 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 the net has a kind of two outputs here. One is what's called the value, which tells you how good the position is, and also the policy, which tells you what move you need to take. So the value will, will trim the depth in the search and the policy will trim uh, the breadth. So you, you, can on, you, you don't have to evaluate too many, you can evaluate only a few of them. And you train those things in turn. This is an amazing algorithm. Uh, it, it works beautifully. In some sense, in, it learns the world of playing Go as well. Okay, this gets encoded in, in this neural net. Okay, so now we have uh, just a few minutes left, and I want to um, spend some time trying to say that this uh, we, we can reuse um, that kind of strategy of two-stage learning in uh, for digital infrastructures. Uh, and specifically, um, one example that I will use is Open Radio Access Network, ORAN. Uh, ORAN was proposed, um, the, the, the several um, kind of good uh, reasons why you, went, you want to be doing this way. Um, but principally, uh, what you want to do is to ma make this more flexible, cheaper, easier to run, so you cut down your CapEx, OPEX. And, and what that means is you're running all the functions that would be done in kind of hardware in all over the place in your network. You, you want to run it in a just few locations and fairly centrally. So you kind of DU, see <coughs> this is the distributed unit and this is the centralized unit and all, all the functions are done in software, in a kind of modular uh, software. So then you can then update them very easily uh, without updating all, all your infrastructure. So, so this is a re really uh, fantastic uh, uh, approach. And specifically, the way you, 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 you develop control policy can be cast on what is known as M MLOps, so machine learning, um, 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 uh, development and, and operations, uh, ML for DevOps, um, a model for Ogran. Because essentially, what you have is lots of those things are centralized uh, in a kind of one location when, when you train the, the, those models. And what you do then is, you know, you can think of it. You've got those sensory te tentacles that you know you 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 glean the elements of the world, you bring them into one location, and you try to develop the optimal policy. And you can see how you know we are we are not far off. Um, um, from, from the situation where you know we, we could basically imagine the world, how it works, um, in the central location, and build this optimal control policy uh, the way I've just outlined. Okay, time to wrap up. Um, so what 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 are the lessons? What can we do? And I want to cast it in a again um, in the, the kind of a framework that we have those two uh, forms of life. Life 1.0, um, very bespoke life, perfectly fit for purpose. Uh, that is what's meant to be, has a small uh, number of tasks ahead of it, 
but, but it does it extremely well. And life 2.0, where it needs um, lots of learning, but then can flexibly uh, um, solve many, many different tasks. And even more importantly, um, it, it can adopt to new tasks with minimal amount of training, it's just called a one shot learning. OK, so that's that's the kind of first point of the discussion. Do we need this? Uh, well, we have well, we're having this already. Do we need that? And I would submit to you that, yes, we should certainly consider that at the very least consider this. So what are the good things um, about doing it according to, to, to this model? Well, we have an interactive model. We, we can look at counterfactuals. So counterfactuals is the ability to go back in time. Okay, very important, um, um, you know, for many different reasons. And once we have that model that uh, works separately uh, uh, from your system or in your brain, if it's a digital brain, it's, it's not really limited by, by time. You can crank up, run it really, really quickly. And another uh, thing uh, that I want to point is potentially much better interpretability. Um, and th but this can only happen if you use this disentangled representation. So, you know, often you wouldn't know um, why things have happened. You need to go back and, and ascertain what was the cause of what has happened. If you have disentangled representation in that model, you, you have a fighting chance to do that. And some reality check. Um, this is not easy. These things are not easy. Um, they've, they've been only successfully deployed in, um, in th those few fields after a Herculean um, effort of, of huge communities. In case of sequential decision making, this only works on a still kind of Atari games and th that type of situation. And certainly, uh, I don't want to get across the idea that that this can be just because it it's learnable. OK, it can be trained, meaning uh, through end to end process. It doesn't mean that this is automatically learnable. Um, and that that actually conveys um, the, the kind of change of of um, thought that happened in uh, with the advent of deep neural nets. So what deep neural nets changed is we are no longer uh, engineering features. OK, this this is automated process, which is great, but there is still tons of effort going into thinking uh, about the architectures for those building blocks. This, this is this comes under the geeky term of relational inductive bias. In other words, you know, depending of your task or sequence or, or set of tasks and the data modality, you still need to think whether you have um, some kind of recursive uh, uh, neural net. If you have the time series, if you have image, you still need to think it needs to be a CNN or if it's um, data that is not on Euclidean, um, uh, space. It's a kind of on a graph. You have graph neural net. Uh, you can have transformers. So you need to build those those Lego blocks still by hand. Okay. So that's that still is the challenge. And just to sum up, um, what I want to say is uh, the kind of uh, sensible way forward would be to combine those two models. So to combine expert models and learnable models in in some coherent one beautiful. Uh, um, uh, entity. And that brings me to the end of this talk. Hopefully there's enough time. But before we move to Q&A, I would like to express my special thanks to lots of people at uh, NGCDI project. I'm not going to put individual names. There's too many people to thank. Uh, but this is a fantastic project and a lot of what I have been presenting is direct results of the interactions and uh, the kind of very stimulating discussions that we've been having uh, for the number of years now. Um, so no, there's a number of our universities and it's, it's a project is funded by EPSRC and BT. Thanks a lot.